write its history, and you have written the history of the commerce of the United States. It's been said that the site of New York's Alexander Hamilton Custom House is not just where the city started, but where the country started. This triangular tip of Lower Manhattan was the heart of New York's earliest colonial settlement. Here in 1626, Dutch colonists bought Manhattan Island from its Native American residents for $24 worth of trinkets. In the years that followed, the Dutch built Fort Amsterdam on this site. But as the role of the harbor changed from national defense to commerce, New York's first custom house replaced the fort. Before the income tax was instituted in 1913, custom duties were the greatest source of revenue for the federal government. New York was the most prominent port in the United States. It did more than three times as much revenue collection as Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore put together. By the late 1800s, the port was so busy that New York needed a new custom house, a building with the size and grandeur suited to the leader of American commerce. Our cities will be as our people will them to be. In May 1899, supervising architect of the United States Treasury Department, James Knox Taylor, invited 20 of the nation's most prominent architects to vie for designing the new custom house. My dearest Julia, the custom house drawings are finished, and so are we. We are all dead used up. I am perfectly satisfied that I have It given was an intense competition that came down one. to two finalists. Carrera and Hastings was among the foremost firms in American architecture. The other was a virtual newcomer, Cass Gilbert. After several months of deliberation, jury unable to decide between C and H and myself, but have definitely placed us above all others. H wants new competition or urges partnership. I decline Gilbert to stand was declared the winner. At the age of 40, Cass Gilbert was a relatively young Midwesterner, but he had earned Taylor's respect as his former partner. Gilbert had spent the past two decades building his reputation in Minnesota. Cass Gilbert is certainly best known for his commercial buildings. However, he designed over 60 beautiful residences in and around St. Paul, Minnesota. The big break for Cass Gilbert was the Minnesota State Capitol. It was an astonishing commission, and he poured everything into it, put him on the map architecturally. When he received the commission for the Custom House, it was a turning point in his career. His business in St. Paul had been struggling and so this made a huge difference to him and to his family. And he wrote to my great-grandmother and said, my dear, our ship has come in. Go out and buy yourself some pretty underwear, and perhaps I will have a one-horse carriage with a man in livery, or maybe one of those new horseless carriages. Gilbert envisioned the Custom House as an icon of the Beaux-Arts belief that Beautiful cities influence society in positive ways. Public buildings explain who we are as a culture, as a civilization. It has very much to do with the public's understanding of government. These buildings speak about government and the ideals of government. Gilbert selected Daniel Chester French to add art to the architecture. French's Minuteman statue in Concord, Massachusetts and his colossal statue of Lincoln in Washington, D.C., made him America's leading monumental sculptor. During the Beaux-Arts era, the best artists of the day were invited to create sculpture and artwork for public buildings like the Custom House. Together, architect and artist would make the Custom House a tour de force of Beaux-Arts style. shape new thoughts, new hopes, and new desires in new forms of beauty, but disregard nothing of the past that may guide us in doing so. Construction of the Custom House began in January 1901. The remarkable thing about the Custom House, of course, is the facade and the whole relationship 
of entry to the street and those four great figures by Daniel Chester French. French's four continents are among the finest examples of Beaux-Arts sculpture, if very much the product of their time. The statue of Asia depicts its oppressed masses. North America, really just the U.S., holds the torch of progress. Europe rests one arm on the law. And Africa is half naked, sleeping between a lion and a sphinx. Every column and corner of the building's facade tells a story from mythology or history. Like these 12 figures in white Tennessee marble lining the six-story cornice, each weighs 200 tons and represents an historically prominent sea trading nation. Inside, the seven-story custom house is large enough to fit a quarter of the Empire State Building. Its size reflects its significance. It makes you feel important. Really great public buildings, from my point of view, don't overwhelm you. They don't make you feel small and insignificant. They make you feel empowered and joyful. The focal point of the Custom House is the imposing central rotunda. Its skylight is one of the largest freestanding oculi in the world, a masterpiece of Spanish engineer Rafael Gostavino. There are no steel supports, though the rotunda weighs 140 tons. The secret to its strength is geometry. Gostavino's tile art system borrows from ancient Catalan vaulting in which interlocking tiles and mortar form self-supporting arches. The rotunda brought beauty and natural light to the engine of American commerce, the custom service. When a ship arrived, the captain or a steamship representative uh, would submit some papers to a customs inspector who boarded the vessel. Brokers would take documents back to the custom house to the entry clerks who sat in the great rotunda inside the marble counters. They would look in their tariff book to see if the broker had the correct tariff and send them to the cashier. In the cashier's office, brokers paid duties at an ornate marble counter. Cashiers sometimes collected a half a million dollars a day. The revenue that was collected was used to pay for Alaska, Louisiana, the Gadsden Purchase, the Transcontinental Railroad, the road system, Florida, and the building of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. More commanding visitors made their way to the collector's suite. These rooms reflected the power of a man appointed directly by the President of the United States. The ceremonial space was divided into a waiting area and a public office by an intricate hand-carved oak screen. The wood finishes and furnishings were designed by Gilbert, but executed by the famed Tiffany Studios. Maritime themes anchored the collector's suite to the harbor outside. Art lined the walls. Elmer Garnsey was commissioned to paint murals that are oil on canvas and are located in the collector's office. They depict the most important ports and cities in terms of seafaring commerce. The room was warmed by a massive con stone fireplace. Through a short passage was the collector's private office where he met with the captains of the world of trade. Lunettes painted by Garnsey depict a camel train, the ships of the desert, and a ship of the sea. Three decades after the building was completed, after Cass Gilbert's death, a final touch was added to the Custom House. Reginald Marsh was commissioned to paint 16 murals in the rotunda. Reginald Marsh was a marvelous artist of his time whose work really depicted the scenes of New York City and the working waterfront. He started by sketching the scenes in a pencil and watercolor. Those images were then projected onto the rotunda walls through the use of a magic lantern device and sketched out and then painted in by his assistants, young women who spent many hours and months with him up on the scaffolding 30 feet in the air on their backs, painting these marvelous scenes of the New York Harbor. Because the walls were concave, it was difficult to maintain perspective 
and to imagine how the paintings would look from the ground, but the artists succeeded. There are eight large panels that depict a ship coming into New York Harbor, passes Ambrose Light, passing the Statue of Liberty, being accompanied by a tugboat as it comes into the port, and a celebrity comes on board, and she is approached by a mob of photographers who are shooting pictures of her, and it's a very vibrant and lively, almost cinematic scene. I had an opportunity to go up on the scaffolding and get up to the murals and look at them face to face. And I can tell you now that even though everybody says Greta Garbo was the one who was being interviewed on the ship, it doesn't look like her. There are also eight smaller panels that are painted in grisaille, which is a black and white um, technique of painting of eight European explorers. The new custom house was completed in 1907. For Cass Gilbert, it shored up a growing legacy. He had begun to define the public face of New York City in 1899 with his classical steel frame Broadway Chambers building. His 1913 Gothic Woolworth building was dubbed the Cathedral of Commerce. It was a charter member of what Kurt Vonnegut later called Skyscraper Park. He was attempting to make a new form a high rise. He was exploring new ideas about what architecture vocabulary should be. And uh, buildings such as this, uh, it's an astonishing legacy to, to leave. In 1929, Gilbert reached the height of his career. He designed the Supreme Court building in Washington, DC. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, the Custom House was a distinguished New York landmark that launched many city celebrations. By the early 1970s, its fortunes began to sink. We want to make this building open and welcoming and accessible. Just over half a century after the Custom House was constructed, the Custom Service moved to the then new World Trade Center. The once celebrated building was empty and half forgotten. The building was very cold and damp. Uh, it was even eerie to walk through and hear your footsteps resound with nobody else around through the marble corridors. Everybody knew it was dangerous to leave it vacant. If you left a building vacant, it would deteriorate. And so we knew the Landmarks Conservancy had to be an aggressive planner for its reuse. The General Services Administration also played a key role. GSA has many challenges, especially as we deal with these historic structures. When you have buildings as significant as the Customs House, we have to do everything possible to make sure that these buildings are viable and remain in the GSA inventory to serve the American public. In 1982, the government requested bids for the restoration and renovation of the old Custom House. It would be a long and costly process. GSA began a restoration project in 1983 that was $29 million, and that was to get the base of the building, which had been open to the elements for about 10 years at this point, uh, back into a condition where we could then market it to tenants. The goal was twofold. It was a restoration as well as a modernization, which sometimes is in conflict, obviously. And the difficulty we had was balancing those two roles. Outside, the facade and statues were cleared of decades of grime. Inside, artwork was cleaned and conserved. The rotunda skylight had been completely tarred over to seal leaks, but now the renovation team restored its original beauty. Five years after the renovation began, the Custom House welcomed its first new tenant, the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York. In 1994, the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of the American Indian opened its galleries. It was ironically close to where colonists had acquired Manhattan from Native Americans three centuries before. Celebrating the people that were first here, the Native American people, and having the Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration right across the waterway that celebrates the people who came here, that juxtaposition, that is one of the central narratives in America's history. We get 300,000 visitors a year. It's a really very popular destination. 
The project also included a new 350-seat auditorium. Putting the auditorium in the basement has opened the building to the public to different venues such as film festivals, uh, public lectures and events of that sort, including federal agencies' use of that space for public meetings. In 1990, the Custom House was renamed for Alexander Hamilton, America's first Secretary of the Treasury. It was the 200th anniversary of Hamilton's financial plan, which helped a new nation prosper. The Alexander Hamilton Custom House is one of the most important structures in the inventory of the General Services Administration. It is the crown jewel and as such requires that we put everything that we possibly can to make sure that the building continues in public use and for the American people. I've been involved in this building since the 1970s and every time I come here I see something new and interesting that I hadn't seen before. And the one thing that I see all the time though are other people coming to this building and admiring all the beautiful artwork and, and the marble that, that this building contains. I'm sure there are other buildings that have this, but no other building in New York City can equal, in my mind, the, the uniqueness of the custom house.